Kava, how are you? Welcome. Welcome. Yay. Kava, you're just in time. Um, Eileen, what's yeah. your friend's name again? Marsha. Marsha, nice to meet you. Okay, guys, let's get started. First of all, it is so nice to be back in person and to see everyone's beautiful faces. Well, half of your faces, your eyes. You'll have to smile big so I can see those crinkling eyes. Um, it's really, really nice to be back. I've missed you all. So nice to see you in person. And um, we have one new person here, Marsha. So for your benefit, I'm just gonna give a quick introduction into kind of the way we roll here. Um, so we've been, you know, looking at the Parsha, the Torah portion for a, a, quite a number of years together. And every year as we go through the, through the Torah, we just, we read it over and over and over again. And every year and every time we read it, we get out new glimmers, we get out new lessons, we, we glean new understandings and new things that we hadn't seen before that didn't touch us the same way the last year. And all of a sudden you're like, whoa, this is huge. And um, the reason that, that that happens and the reason that we, we read the Torah the way that we do, which is not just on Shabbat mornings, but is actually also on Monday and Thursday in, in synagogue, in synagogues, um, is because the Torah is something that is considered to be alive. It's, it's alive, it's a live document, it's, it's moving, it's active. So whenever we relate to anything having to do with the Torah, it's not in a passive way. So you're all sitting here, but you're not sitting here passively. This is a class in which we're active, in which we participate, in which we ask questions and look at things because the, the Torah is meant to be understood that way. It's meant to be understood through questioning, through looking at it, through really exploring it. And, um, and that's, that's how we roll here, okay? And that's what the Torah is all about, is, is being involved because the more involved we are, the more effort we put in, the more active we are, the more we gain. So with that being said, does everyone have, everyone has a homage here in front of you too? Marcy, you have one? No, here's one. So we're going to go through, we start by um, looking at the various highlights in the portion. And we're not going to cover all of the topics because every Parsha has many, many topics, but we will pull out, I try to pull out two to somewhere between two and four lessons that are practical and relevant and, um, and we can really bring home and use in our everyday life, okay? So if I can ask someone to read the highlights, the highlights are found on the left side of the portion. So this week's portion is Parshat Vayera. It's on page 79 in your home machine. What? What'd you say? <laughs> so we are on page 79. And if I can ask someone to just go through and read these highlights, Katie. <laughs> yeah, Sue took, Sue took your job on Zoom. Yes, just the margins here, visiting the sick. Perfect. Yeah, the Hebrew pronunciation is Sodom, but Okay. Um, yeah. Abinola, 
There's a lot here. Yes. Support of Rebecca. No. The first of Rebecca is the last one. Yep. I know. And this is pretty exciting. Okay. So there's a lot here to talk about. I want to start by looking at um, the very first topic that comes up in the portion, which is visiting the sick and hospitality to strangers. So um, it's fascinating because this story revolves around Abraham, around Avram, when it was right after he had performed a, a Brit Milah. So he was quite old. He hadn't performed a Brit Milah and he was given the commandment to give a Brit Milah to, to himself. And he did, right? And well, there, right? There weren't, he was the, he was the, really the only, yeah, there were no balls at that time. He was, he was really like the first, the first Jew. You know, like he was it. So nobody else knew how to do this. This was the first time this was performed. So he was three days after his Brit Milah. And we are taught, and you, it, for any of you who have boys, you can probably confirm this, that the third day after their bris is like really the worst day. It's an agonizing day. The baby's in pain. Like the moms are always a hormonal wreck. Like Right? Does this sound familiar to any of you? This is like me. I'm like, I am not changing the diaper, <laughs> you know? So, um, so this is three days after his breast. He's, you know, he's sitting outside. He's, he's physically in pain. And all of a sudden he lifts up his eyes and he sees three men coming towards him. We'll talk a little bit more about what he saw. We're gonna go into that in depth in lesson number three. But this lesson, number one, which I call making a lasting impression, um, I learned from Rabbi Przansky. And he had this opportunity present itself that on the third day following his bris, he was sitting outside, he looked up, he saw these three men and he said, oh, opportunity, opportunity here, chesed opportunity. Like I, I need to help these guys. It looks like they're walking along in the desert. They, they don't have much. How could I? help them. So despite the physical discomfort he was in, the sages say that it was raining. He was like sitting under his tent. He went and he wanted to, he went out of his comfort zone and went to help him. Now this is a fascinating incident in the Torah because this is actually the only time in the Torah that we have a full menu described. Okay. So like here, this is the only time that we know exactly what he served. He went out and he slaughtered an entire cow and prepared it for these three men. So this is, I mean, that's not physically something that's super easy. Again, he's in discomfort, he's in pain, it's raining outside. There were a lot of ways that he could have overlooked this responsibility and turned the other way and said, oh, well, if it were any other day, I may have like had the, had the opportunity to help these guys, but not today. Today, today I'm not feeling it. So, but he didn't, he went out of his way to go and help these three men who we later find out were angels who were brought to him in order to deliver and share the news that Sarah would have a baby. So we're going to look at a verse inside in a minute. However, before we do that, um, actually, let's just, Let's go ahead and look at this. Let's look at, at chapter 18, verses one through three. Can somebody read it? Just so you get a, a real context for what's going on. Thank you. Okay, now go continue, Laura. Keep keep going until verse eight. Just keep reading just to get a little bit of context here.
input. So then it goes on again to elaborate on that menu. Um, what are your questions on those verses? What? This was before kosher milk or meat, right? Chava's like, whoa, the milk and the cream in the calf. Okay, right? Doo -doo. This is like before kosher. Yeah, exactly. Okay, what else? That's a good question. What else? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Right? That's another thing. Here he is like conversing with God and he sees these three guys come by and he says, wait, sorry, I'm busy. Like, I'm going to go help. Okay, right? Pause, like, you know, putting you on, on pressing the flash button here. Okay, what else? What are your other questions? Exactly. Is this excessive? Is this like excessive hospitality? Okay, good, good. Interesting question. What else? Did he sense they were special? Good. What else? Right. Yeah, good. It's interesting. I actually never noticed that before. Did he wonder if they were circumcised? Okay. Oh, was he like trying to like <laughs> I just I just now I can be the first Moel. Yeah. He actually he actually was the first like outreach professional. He was no really he seriously was. He was he and his wife Sarah were the first outreach professionals they established. They they were the kind of he was Abraham was the one who who looked at the world as a young child and said, I see this glorious world. There must be a creator here. I refuse to believe that there's not someone who created this world. So he was the first one who came to terms with the mono, with monotheism, that there's a God. And he and his wife, Sarah, ran on to, to teach this throughout the entire world. They, and he himself had over 20,000 students and she herself had many, many, many students. I don't know the numbers of hers and many of her own, but really, you know, maybe just as onto something, right? Like, the, you know, um, what else? He's, Abraham is looking at himself as a servant. Okay, good. Okay, good. Yeah, Adrian. Good, who's the youth? Good, probably Eliezer, probably Eliezer, his servant. Probably. Um, so these are all great questions. But what is the what is the one thing we can be clear about, as Laura picked up on? This was like a major show of hospitality. He stopped his conversation with God, as Katie pointed out, and he said, I am going to take care of these guys. I'm going to like really go all out. Maybe, maybe, could be, or maybe that was just the greeting and the, you know, greeting of the time. Curtsy, you know, like a curtsy. Yes. Maybe he felt differently, like he was really all in. Whatever it was, could be. But one, one thing that we, we see playing out in this incident, and we know to be true about Abraham, is that his core character trait was chesed, was kindness. He was really all about kindness. He was all about things like hospitality. He was all about um, taking care of people. He was all about looking at what people needed and trying to give it to them. So he looked down the you know, desert and saw these people that were walking. Again, this was a desert. This isn't like they're walking the dogs, you know, like the dog walkers could go to the gas station and grab a Coke, but there was like, the, there's no Coke oasis in the desert. So he was looking at them and their needs and saying, gosh, they appear to be needy in some way. So I'm gonna go out of my way and help them. That's what we see. Now, what we see also the sages say is that Yishmael 
Abraham's son, he also ran to do chesed. He also ran to do kindness. So we know that Abraham's zeal to do chesed made a strong impression on Yishmael as well. And Abraham's nephew Lot was also impressed upon by Abraham. How do we see, where do we see Lot doing chesed? Lot, yes, no, yes, yes, that's no good, good. Well, where, where do we see Lot doing chesed? So we see Lot doing chesed in the city of Sodom, where it was actually, remember, the city of Sodom was going to be destroyed. Because what kind of city, what kind of inhabitants lived in the city of Sodom? In the city of Sodom, doing kindness was actually prohibited at the penalty of death. So if anyone was found, imagine living in that kind of a culture, mm -hmm. right? Like if anyone was found to be kind or offer hospitality or bring anyone in or give some, doing anything that was kind, they would, they, it, it was, their society was built on self-serving, on just being self-serving. It's all about me, literally built on that. So to the, so they literally were at risk of death. They were, they would be killed if they were found to be kind. So low though, in the city of Sodom, when he saw angels walking through the city of Sodom at, the, at the, the risk of his own life, he was willing to take them in and offer them hospitality. So Lot himself learned also from Abraham. So Abraham rubbed off, not just on Yishmael, who, who we're told, Yishmael, this is Abraham's son from Hagar, who did chesed, but he also rubbed off on Lot. And Lo was willing to, to tremendously sacrifice, even at risk of his own life. When his own life was at risk, he went out of the way to do chesed. So this begs the question. What's, you know, we see that Yishmael and Lo themselves followed after the example of Abraham. We don't see that with Yishmael's children. We don't see that with Lot's children or Lot's family. In fact, with Lot's family, they followed the customs of the, of the city of Sodom. They wouldn't be caught dead doing anything. Well, right? Like they wouldn't be caught doing anything that was kind. Lot's family, Avram's nephew Lot, they wouldn't have performed an act of kindness they never did. In fact, this is fascinating. Lot's wife, she was like, she, she, when Lot was being saved from the city of Sodom, Lot and his family were being led away from the city of Sodom. And, and she was told specifically, don't turn around. Don't look at, don't look back at the suffering that's happening, that's happening over there. Don't turn around. But she couldn't keep away from looking at the suffering of the people in the city. So she turned around. And she actually died there. She turned to, the sages say she turned into a pillar of salt. That's another discussion. We can have that another time. But she wanted to see the suffering. So what's going on here? Like Avram was steeped in chesed, steeped in kindness, steeped in hospitality, went above and beyond to every like dog walker that walked by, he's slaughtering cows for, you know, like providing them oasis of, o oases of, who knows what, so that they can like thrive and flourish and function in the middle of a desert. And Yishmael and Lot, who lived in the house of Abraham, were, themselves were affected. But what about their children? Why didn't they follow in the example of their, of their parents, of Lot and in Yishmael themselves? Okay, okay. Good, good. Okay, what else? Okay, yeah, you must live in my house, right? Yeah, but peer pressure, okay, peer pressure against doing the, the right thing. What else? Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Good. Interesting. What else? Mm -hmm. 
Interesting. Interesting. I want to share a story with you to address this question. Okay. When Jews first came, when observant Jews first came to America, came from Ellis Island. Um, in fact, my aunt and uncle were just visiting Ellis Island and found a relative's name there, which was like just so unbelievable. So when observant Jews first came to America, and there is a well-known, um, you know, what happened to many of these observant Jews is that um, when Shabbos would come, they were told that they had to work on Shabbos. And if they didn't work on Shabbos, then they would lose their jobs. So many Jews, many of these observant Jews, you know, they went, they went basically week to week. They got a job. They started working on Sunday. And on Friday, yeah, I'm going to take what you're going to say one second. Let me just finish the story. Um, on Friday, they ended, um, they said, I'm sorry, we can't come back tomorrow. And the boss said, well, then don't bother coming back on Sunday because you, you won't have a job. And, um, and they said, okay. So then they had to do the whole thing again. Sunday, they had to find another job. And week after week after week, this went on. And, but they sacrificed tremendously for Shabbos. They, they were willing to do it. Like they, they, they had to find a new job. Can you imagine that? Like mm -hmm. lack of stability and talk about, I mean, they were really working these Jews when they first came over, they were working to just put bread on the table. And yet they sacrificed tremendously for Shabbos because it was so important to them and such a value to them. And yet their own children didn't carry on the legacy of Shabbos. They didn't, they weren't Shabbos and servant. So the Jews in the next generation went to the greatest rabbi of the generation, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, and they said, Rabbi, can you please explain this? Look at all of these great Jews who sacrifice week after week after week to, to observe Shabbos. And what's happening with their children? Why are there, why have there, are there children? Why are they leaving it? Why are they not Shabbat observant? And Rabbi Feinstein said, the first thing is we cannot judge those Jews. Those Jews had a test that none of us could ever imagine. We could never judge them. And I want you to know that many of them came to me and said, this Shabbos thing is so hard, but we have to do it. So their children heard Shabbos is so hard. They didn't hear the Shabbos is so beautiful. Shabbos is so sweet. They didn't hear if I didn't have Shabbos, I would die. Like they didn't hear that. You know, they, they just heard the Shabbos is so hard. And because that's what they heard, that's what they latched onto. And so going back to Lot and Yishmal and why they didn't carry on the legacy of Avraham. So Avraham never said this, this chesed is, is a burden. He said this chesed is a pleasure. This chesed is giving me way more than I'm giving anyone else. So therefore his own children carried it through, but their children, they never saw it. They didn't see like Lot, Lot's children could never see him doing chesed. Even though he spoke about it, they could never see him doing chesed because it was outlawed. So even if he spoke about it, they're gonna follow what they saw. And, um, Avraham lived it and he lived it in a way that, that, it, that it was a pure pleasure for him, that it was something beautiful, that it was special, that it was enjoyable. And, um, you know, I, I think we can all relate to this on some level that if we are living something in a way that's true and authentic and view it as pleasurable, that's when we can hope to influence. But if something is a constant burden and feels that it's a burden, the people that are around us are going to sniff that out. And I, you know, I see it all the time with my own kids. Like if I'm making a Shabbos meal and like, I'm like, oh, you know, like they're coming in 15 minutes, the house is a disaster. You know, like they're like, they, they don't want to have gas the next week. But if it's like, guys, like, this is so awesome. Like, what, you know, what are we going to play? Like, what's, you know, then they feel that. And the energy that 
we put out and put in is the energy that people around us are going to sense. And that's what Avram, like Julie said this, maybe they didn't want it to overtake him, but Avram never felt overtaken by Chesed. He felt like he was, he was living it up. And, and the children of Lot and Ishmael didn't absorb it in the same way because their fathers didn't feel it in the same way to be able to pass it on. So it's just something to think about and put out there, like what is our attitude? And when we really live something in a deep way, it is, it, it is, that's what, that's what influences. That's what people sense. That's what people um, are attracted to and, and feel um, like gravitate towards that feeling, the, the emotionality, the, you know, the feeling of it. And, and when we live by example, that's what Avram did also. He lived by example. So his own children gravi saw him doing this, but Lot's children and Ishmael's children didn't see that example. So they didn't, they didn't see the example. I have a friend, I'll just share this good story. I have a friend who, she's never told me, but I really think that she has like on her to-do list make sure to do at least one chaser every day because I've often been the recipient. <laughs> and, um, but it's such a beautiful, like it's, I think she implemented it. She did tell me she, she had implemented it during COVID with her kids. Like we have to do, th this has to be a part of our life. And it, her kids are getting that very positive sense around chesed, you know, around giving. So um, just putting it out there. Adrian had something, Chava had something first. Chava, what'd you have? Mm -hmm. Okay, Adrian. Oh, hi. No, not, not, not. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Very good point, yeah. It's fascinating, you know, like, yes, it, it's, it's interesting. And I have, it's interesting what you're saying. And I have like, just, I'll share with you what ran through my head is we are, we live across the street from Rabbi Ephraim Torsky, who's part of the like grand Hasidic Torsky legacy. His, mm -hmm. his uncle, his great uncle was Rabbi Dr. Abraham Torsky, who wrote 99 books, passed away actually um, at, at when he was authoring, in the middle of authoring his 99th book um, just last year, his father is a rabbi in Milwaukee and they're, they're real Hasidim. Like they walk around the street. He walks around the street with like one of those like big fur, like Hasidic hats, white socks sometimes, like pants tucked in. And his kids dress like he does and they, are the most happy, do not look at themselves or feel themselves different. And you know what, they're not internally, like they're, we, but it's such a beautiful thing to be able to pass that on. Like what you're saying is they felt so different, but I see the Tversky's who are like, we're different and so proud. Yeah, it's, it's just- it's, bring it down for y'all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is really great for me because I struggle with we all do, but yeah, I'm I'm a, I'm a bitch at home, and I'm negative, and I complain, and they know how miserable I am, relatively speaking, and how difficult they are. And so they you know, they're never comes up there. I'm never having kids. I'm never having kids. Oh, oh, I see my kids. Yeah. So yeah. just change that. It's only for that. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if that's really will be the case, but like, yeah. if they saw the joy that I do get, and I do get joy. Yeah, of course. <laughs> But this is really great. I'm really yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, I think we all can relate to this. I mean, I, you know, I say all the time, I only teach what I need to work on. So like that's, you know, 100% very, very true. And I think we can all relate to that. Parenting is the like one of the hardest challenges that any of us have in our lives at whatever stage of parenting we're in or whatever stage of life we're in. Um, so yeah, that's a really, really good point. Yeah. Uh. 
What'd you say? Oh, she. Was she hard? I don't. I don't believe it. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah, she says easy. I believe it. Really? I can't even believe it. Yes. Yeah. Please. I just. I didn't know this when I was getting but um, and then I learned how when his grandfather was a taxi driver in America, born in America, because he was coming to the as far as the state to work on Saturday. So the taxi driver was promoted because they were bringing people and wanted to go to college. It's just, you know, all these mm -hmm. college options mm -hmm. groups were could go and they could get a job outside of being a taxi driver. So my <gasps> father was my father wife, I never was his father, so much about the people. And wow. so two of you know the Kids kind of has a, a brother and a sister. His sister's not, but his brother and his sister going to his grandparents and doing the chickens and the caparas and going to buy nuts and meals. Like his idea wow, and his nice. nice. yeah. And like my husband's grandpa was in the chapel. So when I was pregnant, I'm like, I need my son. Oh, that is. This whole thing's going to work on Saturday. Oh, yes. Can you sing fun. it? I, I mean, I talk with him. Right. right. That is so beautiful. Chava, that's amazing. I really got the chills. That's a beautiful story. Yes, See, I, like I always tell Yaakov, right there in the flesh. What? I always tell my Yaakov. You right? You have a big yeah, legacy, my really friend. Right. Yeah. Okay. Wow, I love that. It's awesome. Okay. Anything else before we move on to the next yes. lesson? Yes. Yeah. My yeah. But the a different risky. That's amazing. You're so. That was called making a lasting impression. Okay, so lesson number two is um, something I heard from Rabbani Yamima Mizrahi, and I call it do a double take. So, um, Parshas Vayera, right? That's, that's what the Parsha is called. And it, there are many references here, including in the name of the Parsha, to the word Re'e, okay, Vayera is from the word Re'e, to see. The, the, the Parsha begins, Vayera elav Hashem, that Hashem appeared to him. It's from the root word Re'e. And in fact, I want you to look at this verse one more time that we already read, and I'm going to ask you for a really good question. And whoever gets it, gets the ding, ding, ding. Okay, <laughs> so look at verse number two. Um, page 79. It's not as easy to pick up in the in the English. That's the truth. Okay. Hang on. I'm gonna read it for you in Hebrew and I'm gonna translate it. Okay. Vayisa enav, and he lifted up his eyes, Vayar, and he saw the Hinesh Losha Anashim Mitzavim Elav. And he saw three men that were kind of standing around above him or around him. Vayar. And he saw and he ran to greet them from the tent opening, from the, from the opening of his tent, and he bowed to the ground. Okay, good, very good question. Good question. What? Ding, 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 ding. Okay, so why did he see Twice. Why does the why does the verse say? Remember, as we've talked about many times, that every word in the Torah is there with purpose. There's no extraneous word here. So here, it says right away, by sign up, and he lifted up his eyes, by yar, and he saw, and then he saw these three men standing over him, and again, by yar, and he saw. Okay, you already said he saw. We know he saw. What? Did he, okay, did he see God? What was the second, what was the second scene? What? He wasn't talking to them yet. No. Mm. Interesting, good. I like it. Eileen's doing like a, that's my daughter. <laughs> right? <laughs> now look at her. <laughs> exactly. Um, Ah, 
Adrian. Interesting. Well, Good. I, I like. Good. 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 So what you're all, good. So what you're all getting is these are two different kinds of something that's going on. Two different kinds of vision here. It wasn't like he just saw and then he saw again. There was something that was different about these two incidences of Vayar, two incidences of him seeing, right? So what was it? So Rashi says that the first Vayar, the first was that he saw, he just saw. And the second, he saw the angel, he saw these men who were actually angels. And the second Vayar, he perceived. Interesting. So he didn't only see, in the second time, he didn't only see like three people walking towards him. He understood that this was an opportunity. He perceived mm -hmm. something. It was something deeper than the first form of vision. So what happened at first glance? At first glance, he saw these three guys kind of walking towards him. He was maybe even a little bit worried about their intentions. Like, I'm out here alone in the desert. What are these three guys doing out here? Like, I'm the only one around. What are they doing here? And I, I just, I'm like in a totally weakened state, you know, like a third day after bris. Like, I'm down for the count here, or at least I could be down for the count. And what, what, what like, what's going to be? I'm a little nervous. Bayar actually is, is related also to the word yira, which means fear. Okay. Um, but then he came to a new conclusion. With the second Bayar, he came to a second conclusion. Oh, he understood. He perceived something. Oh, opportunity. These guys are hungry, they're thirsty. What can I do for them? So at first he just saw and was even a little bit fearful. And then he perceived there was something more. If you think about it, actually, the first time that you encounter something usually involves a little bit of fear. Think about like your firsts, right? Like first day on a new job, Ooh, right? Like first, um, first date, Ooh, right? Like first, um, what? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Your first birth, well, every birth. Right? Like, yeah, exactly. It's the first time walking in the center. There's a little bit of traffic. There's a little like anxiety, a little bit of, you're very welcome here. Um, so you're, you know, like, yeah. So there's always a little bit of fear. Like, you know, when there's something that happens at first, marriage, uh, first date, like all these first, invoke a little bit of fear. And then the Torah here is saying, but hang on guys, don't take things at face value. Don't just look at it the way it is at first. Got to pause because there's always something deeper. There's something more here for you to perceive, more here for you to understand. There's more here. And that happens in the few words between the two Bayars. First he saw, then there was a little break, few words in the phrase, in the, in the verse. He lifted up his hand, he saw there they were. And they were standing over him and then he perceived. In that space between seeing and perceiving, there was just a little bit of pause, a little space. And that space let him think. It let him access, oh, opportunity here. Oh. There's something more here. Oh, I don't have to be afraid. Oh, there's something I can accomplish here, something I can do here. So even though the first impression, the first scene might've been like fight or flight, you know, like, uh, then when he took a, another second, when he thought it through, waiting a moment and looked again, he realized, oh, there's something else here. There's something more I can do. And in that pause, one second, in that pause, in that space between like an initial reaction and jumping to conclusions or initial fear, that's when Avraham, and that's when we all can ask that spiritual growth question. And that spiritual growth question is what? 
what like what can i do what what can i how can i go grow through this what what does god want from me in this moment what can i be gaining what can i be doing what how can i push myself how can i stretch myself how can i make hashem proud right like all those really the spiritual question growth question is really what like what what can i do here not why but what so and in that little pause that gives us space to ask that question gives us a little time to say like what more is there for me to perceive what more is there for me to understand and to do and accomplish and that's what avram did and that's why hashem saw fit to say the same word twice in the same verse because that's what Avram, that's what Avram did between the first and the second was there was space. It gave him pause to slow down. And then he was able to do what he did, which is like basically shifted the course of the trajectory of his life forevermore because these angels who he went out of his way for to prepare these delicious, you know, food for were the ones to deliver the news that the, the course of the rest of his life would, would change forever with the birth, birth of Yitzchak, Isaac. They deliver that news just on the next page. So that in that pause, there's room to ask the spiritual growth question. And that's why Hashem saw fit to add these two, the same word twice. Because in between the vision and the perception is a little bit of time. And that, in that little bit of time, in that pause, um, Lauren, it reminds me of the quote from our trip, like going all the way back to the, the to our trip with the with you on the postcard. Do you remember the quote? Yeah. Who knows the quote? Yeah, what's the quote? Um, yeah, what's what's the what's the quote? I don't remember. It's Ellie Weisel's. Yes, do you remember? It's Ellie Weisel's. It's like quote. it's like between. Between something and the pause, there's a space. And in that space is uh, where something happens. <laughs> yes. No, it's not that one. That is another one. But this is, OK, whoever finds it, you'll share it. Liz is looking. Um, is And that's, you know, that's part of the idea. In between response, something and response. response yeah. Right. There's a pause. And so this is in the, we see it right here in the verse. Like here is, is, is initial reaction, just a little bit of pause and another understanding. And that led to something that was grand, something that was huge. Between stimulus and response, yeah. there is a space. That space is our power to choose our response. And our response is mm. can, so I, can I give a real life example? You can. I don't know Please. if people can hear me. Yeah, um, we, everyone can hear you, Jess. Okay. Well, so a few months ago, uh oh, here we are. A few months ago, Larry uh, was laid off. And so we, yeah, so it was very, it's been very stressful around our house. But I said, I think this was as, as awful as it sounds. I said, I think this was meant to be. Um, and Larry's like, oh my gosh, like it would have been way better to like, find a job while I have a job. This is just not the way I wanted it to be. But I felt like in he just got an offer like a day ago. And the the owners of the company are so much menschier. And I think he'll be so much happier. But I think like there needs to be a long pause in between for him to like see that. Yeah, that's amazing. Great example. Wow, Jess, I want to talk to you more about that. Yeah. Um, good example. Oh, Julie, you were going to say something before, I feel like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yep. Yep. He's old and, and afraid, exactly. I'm 
Yeah. Yeah, it is very important. So even ask yourself that spiritual growth question. Like how many times, I mean, this is just like me personally, how many times have I said, you know, my reaction comes out first and then a minute later, I'm like, I'm so sorry, hold on. I'm so sorry, but it's too late. I didn't take the pause, but I try. <laughs> so maybe the next time I'll take a little bit longer pause and can reach it before I let that thing come out. But, you know, but even that, like right after it comes out, you can say, okay, like, whoa, whoa, that probably wasn't where I was supposed to go. That wasn't exactly like what Hashem had intended for me in this moment. You know, but okay, we'll, we'll keep working on that. But in that pause is when we can ask that question, like, what are we supposed to do here? And how do we, like, I mean, it, you know, we don't have to slaughter cows, you know, like, <laughs> there's like, you know, a jewel, you know, like, but whatever, what, but the question is like, what do we, what, that's, you know, what's, what should I do here? What can I do to grow? Did you have a question, Marcy? No. Right. You're not in control and you don't have to be. Isn't that a relief? Right. Oh, that's amazing. Okay. No, it's not so simple. Yeah, absolutely. Love that. Mm. Mm. I love that. I love that. That's beautiful. Can you be quiet for a second? <laughs> yes, actually, I love water. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, what did you say, Katie? And just like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. We know Mars. We love you. Right. Okay. So let's go on to lesson number three, because it's a good one. I don't want to leave you guys without it. And this one is called Akedat Yitzchak Today. Okay? The Binding of Isaac Today. So for this one, don't worry. Nobody's like not doing this. Um, what does this mean? So let's go to chapter 22, verse 13. So for that, we are going to be looking at the bottom of page 103. Um, I hope that what I want to get across, no, it's not going to come across in the English again. Okay, someone read it, read it, and then I'll, I'll share with you the word if you don't get the question. Um, verse number 13, the bottom of page 103. Someone read it. I have to read it to you in English because I don't think you're going to get the question, but I want just, I'm going to read it to you in, in I'm going to translate it as we go through the verse and listen and, and see if you can get the question. And Avram lifted up his eyes. And behold, and he saw, behold, hang on, sorry, backtrack. And he saw, behold, there was another ram. Who was caught in the thicket, Vikarnov, by its horns. That's all that's relevant. Well, ding, ding, ding. Liz, you're like dinging today. Um, exactly. Another ram. It says right there in the Hebrew. It's in English, it's translated as, as behold a ram afterwards. In Hebrew, achar can either be after or another. After 
Afar can be right. What does that even mean? Behold a ram afterwards, like after what? Or like acher is? What do you mean another ram? Like, and what? Where's the first ram? Right. So like, what is what is going on here? What is this really? Um, what's really going on here? So. It, it, you know, the, the story is that Abraham saw this ram and sacrificed this ram instead of sacrificing Isaac. And, but the Mepharshim, the sages try to understand this word, acher, like another ram. There was no, there wasn't the first one. So there's this fascinating commentary called the Or Shamayim that answers this really puzzling question. And he quotes the Chosa of Lublin that says that this other ram is actually referring to the fact that there are other akedat yitzchats. There are other binding of Isaacs, not just this one in the Torah. There are other binding of Isaacs. Huh? We only know of one in the Torah and we hope we don't ever have a, like another example of that. That was so hard. But he says the, Orla Shamayim says that there are other ones. No, no. So listen what he says. He says there are other bindings of there are other bindings of Isaacs. And when are those other bindings or when are those other sacrifices? The or the Shamayim says that it whenever a person overcomes themselves, that is considered a sacrifice, a binding of Isaac moment. So let's go through that. Let's go through that a little bit deeper. So if you look into this verse, according to that explanation, the, the verse would read, and then I'll explain it and we'll flesh it out, that there are other akedat yitzchaks. Okay, so the verse says, and and behold, there are other bindings of Isaacs. There are other akedat yitzchaks. Because the Sabah, the Svach, sorry, what are the Hebrew words? The Echaz, the when one is caught in the thickets, meaning one is caught up in something. One is stuck. Stuck. One is stuck. This ram was stuck. When somebody feels stuck in any way and they overcome that stuckness and overcome themselves and are able to rise above that, that is another binding of Isaac. That is another sacrifice that we are making and so to speak, offering up to God saying, God, this is so hard for me. I am stuck. I am like, I want so badly to break out of this character trait. I want so badly to break out of this behavior, but I'm stuck here and I can't seem to do it. So then we go back to the verse and says, but I, but I'm, I'm, I'm able, I, I'm going to push through. I'm going to, I'm going to break through this. I'll push through where I'm stuck. I'm going to pull myself out of, I'm going to extricate myself from this. And even one time, if I can pull myself away from this and respond in a different way, or, um, you know, act in a different way or pull myself away from this phone for one more hour or whatever it is in any tiny way, that's called another, that's called another Akedat Yitzchak. That's another one. That's why it says Acher here, because, you know, It's not easy. That's not easy. And in fact, why do we use the shofar on Rosh Hashanah to to um, to blow? Like, why is this? Why is the shofar the symbol of um, you know Hashem is King? That's what we're really expressing on Rosh Hashanah. We use the shofar. Why do we use the shofar? The shofar is the ram of this horn. This horn that was caught in the thickets, because on Rosh Hashanah is the day when we're saying, God, we want to break free from all those things that are binding us, that are holding us, that are constricting us, that we feel caught and we feel like we can't move out of these places. 
So we're, we're like going from the, the shofar begins, has a very narrow hole at the beginning and an expansive hole at the end because we say, I want to go from narrow to expansive. I'm super stuck. I have so truly hard. It's what? It's really it's like oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, you're a musician. I forgot that. It's super hard. Yeah, it's hard. So why don't we, what, like, why don't we use, yeah, exactly. And why are we using, why don't we use anything? You know, we use this ram because this, the ram itself got stuck. And so here the verse reads, there's this other ram. There's going to be other, there are other Akedas Yitzchaks. And every time that you or I extricate ourselves from an area where we feel stuck and we've tried countless times to change this behavior. And we, one time, we are able to overcome that. That's an Akedah Yitzchak. That's a sacrifice. And the this um, Orla Shemayim says, it says a little bit further, it says, Bikarnav. And you know the word. The word in the verse reads that it's caught by its thorn. So another word, another way to read bikarnav is um, is that karen means shine, because when we can pull ourselves out of that, we literally shine a light. Like we, it, it and I think we can all relate to that almost. Like when we can pass a test where we have felt stuck we feel like, I feel like shiny, <laughs> you know, like, I feel like this was so hard and look at me, like, yeah. and that, that's, it says right here in the verse and it shines, the Orla Shemayim says, it doesn't just feel like shiny inside of us. This shines all, our light shines all the way to the Kisei cover to the throne of God. And that's like a little example of a, of a, of a, um, of an Akedah Yitzchak, of a sacrifice of, of Isaac. And on um, Rosh Hashanah, one of the things that we say in Shemona Esrei is we say the Akedah Yitzchak Lizaro Hayom Tiskor. Remember Akedah Yitzchak today. So what we're really asking Hashem is to remember the little Akedahs that have the little sacrifices that happen every day. Meaning this is something that, yeah, this was one incident in the Torah was probably the hardest test of Abraham's life, um, which I have a little bit more to say about, but I don't think we have more time that, um, you know, we can do this even in our days, like even in our days that when we, when we push through something that is hard or break free from something that we feel is binding us, that's a little Akeda Yitzchak. And that's something that we can, you know, that we can pull through. The Shla offers two ways to push through and to actually, this is another commentary who offers two ways to push through um, when we feel bound. He says two things. He gives two recipes for success. The first is he says, like similar to that pause, is he said, number one is to just stop and think. Like just to stop and think and say like, whoa, this is a moment that I feel bound. Am I being asked to sacrifice a little here to pull away from what's binding me, it will. It, it's going to feel hard, just like you know, just like that initial akeda yitzchak, the binding of Isaac. It might feel hard, but to stop and think: is this is this an akeda yitzchak moment? Like, is there something I can pull away from here that I can, I can overpower myself? You know, like can I pull myself? Everyone has different examples. Can I pull myself through not reacting towards? a child? Can I pull myself away from making a critical comment towards a spouse? Can I pull myself away from my phone? Can I, like, any of these things are all areas that require, number one, as the Shal says, thought. Number two is um, to just have the awareness. This actually might be a moment where I'm being offered an opportunity to grow. And I'm going to seize this opportunity. And, and then it's, and then this, it's, it's another, it's an, it, this is another moment of the binding of Isaac. This is another moment and we can have that in, in our day. I want to give a quick review. I want to take questions. I want to take comments before I do that. And then I'm going to offer homework. Any questions, comments? Oh. 
No, we haven't. It, it's because I'm. It's really resonating with me. It's like super resonating. With me. Oh yeah, that's like I know. So, so this fine her. I. Oh, I love that. It's also Eliza. Yeah. Yeah. Foundational. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Very true. Beautiful point. Okay. Anyone else? Question? Comment? What? Oh, anyone, anyone else question comment before we do a quick review homework? Okay, so I'm gonna just do a quick review, um, which is number one, lesson number one, we talked about making a lasting impression. So Avram was set this example, not just by talking about chesed, doing chesed, but actually living it. Nishma and Lot were a little different, even though they may have spoken about chesed, they didn't live it in the same way that Avram did. So if we want to really make an impression, it comes through through our attitude and through our actions. And that's how to, to influence. Now, lesson number two, we talked about doing a double take, but the verse says, Re'e, that Avraham saw twice. The first is vision, the second is perception. And in between is a little pause. And in that pause, we can ask ourselves the spiritual growth question. How can I grow through this? What am I intended to do here? What should I, you know, how do I, what's, what's an opportunity? What can I achieve? Okay. Lesson number three, today, is that the verse says, and Abraham saw another ram. What does that mean, another ram? And Hashem is saying, don't worry, in every opportunity, in every single generation, you're going to have opportunities to perform a Kedas Yitzchak. And that's going to be when you feel bound and you feel confined and you feel constricted. And you pull away from that and you refrain and you just take a moment to, to take a break and, and, stop, and, and maybe take a slightly different direction. That's your Akeda Siyotzchak. And that shines a light all the way from where you are, all the way up to the Kisei Kabbalah, straight to the throne of God. And with that, I'd like to offer homework that one time this week that you take a moment to pause. Take a moment to pause. Perhaps in this moment, you think about, um, you know, maybe you find yourself in a test in that moment, like, and, and go through your two steps. Think, like, yeah. You know, just to just do this once and yeah, no, but you might. So Julie, if you can do it more than once, what I'm saying, like live the Parsha. The idea is to live the Parsha, to live the Torah. And it, as you go through your week, one time, find yourself in this pause. Maybe as you find yourself through this pause, you're going to go through the Shlaz two steps to think, you know, what am I supposed to be doing here? And number two, is this a moment? Is this a test that Hashem is giving me? And, ha you know, what's my opportunity here? So at least one time this week, just just go through the, the two vayars. Start with vision. You find yourself in fear and anxiety or whatever and pause and get yourself through it into perception. Okay, that's your homework. And with that, report back wow. next week. Okay, thank so you. Oh my gosh. Thank you. So nice to be back. You're welcome. I'm so glad you were here. I'm so glad you're all here. So glad I'm here. Um, a question about something that you said in Yes, yes, yes. Tell me about how you read Torah on Monday. Mm. Yes. So in in many synagogues, Torah is read both on Shabbat and throughout the week on Mondays and Thursdays. There are certain sections of the Torah are read on that are read on Mondays and Thursdays, and that is so that we don't go more than three days without reading Torah. I, yes, I, you read just parts of it through Monday and Thursday. I don't know because I'm never there, but I think you read portions. It's it's read down in our history. I don't know that. Okay. 
So it's not the Parsha, right? It's other, it's sections. I don't know what it is. Then he read those sections on Monday and Thursday. Right, he wants it just sections of the Parsha, right. Maybe, yeah. The first, second, and third on the Monday. I don't know. I don't know exactly how it's broken up, but somehow it's broken up. Let's shift away from there's no Friday and Saturday. There's no Friday and Saturday. No. It doesn't. I love that this question comes up from somewhere else, and it is a practical, it is a lifestyle question. It's just, it's just knocked out two years later. The halls are cheaper during the week. Jess, love you. Bye, Jess. Bye. See you soon. Thank you. I'm going to just stop recording. People want to talk, but I'm going to have to turn the recording. There's my pajamas. I was just going to say, look what I'm wearing. Oh, we could be twins.